Hey everyone, this is a um, <coughs> this is a belated recording of tute two. Um, there's kind of four questions in this tute, but we're mainly going to focus on the third and the fourth one. I think firstly, though, the uh, part zero of this tutorial is um, pretty much offering people to be a class representative if they're interested. And what this essentially means is that um, uh, if you'd like to kind of contribute in a bit more of a direct fashion, like maybe provide some more detailed feedback on the course or share your ongoing thoughts on assessments or or anything um, then please let me know there's no marks associated with it it's purely for engaged students to feel like they have an avenue to actually engage more if you'd like to do that then you can just uh, you can just email me hayden.smith uh, at unsw.edu.au like that um, pretty straightforward so I'm going to jump to question three and four first, because this was the um, question that my students were most interested in. And um, the thing about question three and four is that question three is focused on writing a Node.js script, and question four is focused on um, using JavaScript in the web browser. Now, this comes up more in the Thursday lecture about JavaScript and the language and transpilation, but the short answer for the meantime is that you need to remember that JavaScript itself is essentially just a programming engine. Um, and you're familiar with it if you've watched the JavaScript syntax lecture because that highlights what JavaScript is and how it works. But that's just like JavaScript core. Then there's really an extension of it into the command line interface world, which is Node.js, um, where it essentially behaves a lot like Python in terms of there's a package manager, um, you can run it on command line like scripts. And then the second way that that kind of core JavaScript is used is on the web browser. And on the web browser um, is where you actually, yeah, like literally run it in Google Chrome or something. Um, and both of those have different features, right? Like if you're running things in this Node.js command line interface world, you can do things like read from the file system, right? Just like you can in Python. Whereas when you're doing something in the web world, the web browser world, you can do things like access the URL of the web page you're on or make an alert to the user to tell them that something has happened. Um, so they're two very different things, but let's have a look at this question three first. Um, you can write JavaScript in Node.js and um, an example of that's been written here in range.js. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, we've already provided the the solution here, I think. Um, yes. So a JavaScript file, um, range.js, the program is being completed by you. The program must read in a text file, one of data one, data two, and data three, which contains integers on some lines of code. So basically there's these three data files here. Data one just contains some integers between zero and a thousand. Data two contains bigger integers and some are negative, And data three contains um, integers and some spaces essentially. Um, and what we want to do is go through all those integers and print out the lowest and highest number and the, the, the gap between the highest and lowest number. So in the case of data one, the answer is pretty obviously 423 is the highest number, two is the lowest number, so the range is uh, 421. We want it to print out correctly for all these files. Now in this particular shoot, um, the answer is actually already provided for us just to kind of make things a bit easier. Um, and I'm just going to step you through different parts of it. So the first thing is, in this Node.js script, is we have this open data1.txt. Now, you can see here on this first line that what we're doing is we are including the FS library, which is basically the file system library. So this is how you include stuff in Node.js. Um, and this, this really is akin to, if it was Python, um, uh, I guess this would just be import fs, really. So fs is the, the library, and we're just storing it in a variable here, so we can use it later. And then what we're saying is the data we're interested in is actually, we're going to use the file system library, and then we're going to read a file, and the two things we pass into that read file are the file name, um, as well as the encoding. So the encoding is, um, in this case, utf8, which is kind of like the one of the broadest definitions of character encoding. So at one end you have ASCII, which is just like 
all of the keyboard keys basically and at the other end you have UTF-8 which includes like you know funky European stuff you know those like E's with dots above them and even emojis I believe so that that part you don't need to worry about too much if we just were to console log that which is the Node.js way of printing something we could run that on command line so if I go into tute 2 I have my files here I could run node range.js and what it's going to do is it's going to open the file and it's going to print it out and you can see that it actually prints it out in one chunk here it looks like we could test that if we want by putting two pipes there and see what it does so you see it has one pipe and then another pipe and then everything's printed as a single piece of string um, between those so the next thing we want to do is actually break this Pete this string into an array or list of some sort and we can do that because in Python and sorry in JavaScript um, each string has a dot split method so read file sync returned us a string in Python and then we can take our string and we can split it off every new line character and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to print out um, the lines so the dot split turns a string into a an array of strings so there's our array of strings. As you can see, we have um, this meaning array or list, and then we have each string here, comma, separated, and that includes the last string because there's an empty line at the end of the file there. Okay, so that's a good thing. Um, the next thing we want to do is actually figure out what the smallest and largest value is. Now, there's, there's obviously faster ways to do this, but we're kind of doing this in a very basic programming approach, and we're going to use the standard pattern of you set your minimum to be a really big number, you set your maximum to be a really small number. And then as you loop through the numbers, if you see a minimum that is smaller than your min, your current min, you set it to that. And if you see a max that's bigger than your current max, you set it to that. Um, so we start our min off as some stupid number like 99 billion. And we set our max off as some stupid number like negative 99 billion. Now what we want to do is go through each of the numbers that we read right so on the terminal that's like each of these in the array now we as you know from the other lecture we can go through these pretty easily by saying um, you know for what's, what is it it's like uh, const uh, line of lines now in JavaScript when you do a for range loop which is like line um, something lines if you do line in lines which is very Python-esque what that will do is each loop line will actually be the index of the array right it won't be the value so a something in something for range loop is actually a little bit different to what you'd expect in a language like Python um, this will give you the index but if you want the value which is like your standard for range loop in Java or Python then you need to use of here and we can print those all out so if we print out each line here um, you'll see that we get each number. Now this is actually printed as a string, which is a little bit problematic for us because we want to do some like um, math on it basically. Like that's what, like we want to use the comparison operator, the less than or greater than. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to um, try and turn it into a number, right? And to do that in JavaScript, you can use parseInt. Now parseInt takes in a data type and it tries to turn it into an integer and then we can print out that number. So we're going to print out the number, but this time instead of it being a string, it's going to be an integer. Now, my terminal has colored those differently, which is helpful, but you'll also see that this very last one here is NAN, um, NAN, which means not a number. Um, this is a very weird peculiarity of JavaScript that it doesn't throw an error or raise an exception, um, but it just seems to parse it into this magical type. Um, so there's a few ways around that. One is we could check if the result of the conversion is NAN, or alternatively, we could just try and avoid parsing anything that was a blank line. So I could say um, if line is not equal to um, empty string. Now, a really important thing I need to do here, make sure that every kind of equality comparison you do is either triple equals or not equal equal, because we want to do value and type checking. So now let's see what this gives us. We get all these numbers. So next step is to um, basically do the checks on each one. So say like if the number is less than the min, then it's the new min, right? Like if it's smaller than the minimum we found, it's the new minimum. So 
and we'll set the minimum to be the number. And if the number is greater than the maximum, then it's the new maximum. So we do that. And then at the end of this for loop, once it's done all those numbers, we can print out min and max and see what it does. Okay, we get 2 and 4, 2, 3. And therefore, we can say that the range of the number is max minus min. And then we get 4, 2, 1. Now, another thing to do here is that um, you can do this kind of concatenation approach, which is fine. However, generally a more accepted way to do this would be to use backticks, and backticks do a very similar thing to kind of, again, like Python F strings, where if inside the backtick string I do a dollar and then braces, everything inside those braces is essentially um, processed like it, it's not a string, like it's actually a variable. So here I could say max minus min. And you can see this is a, a substantially more readable approach to what we had before. So now we get the range is equal to 421, and that's similar to what's here. Um, there is this optimizations part where it's like you can also actually write this in m many fewer lines. Um, you're welcome to do that if you'd like, but I'm not going to go through it now. But basically there's, um, there's a set of functions like map, reduce, and filter, and this is using the spread operator. These are all features of JavaScript that um, have become a lot more common in recent years. Um, so you can use them if you'd like, but generally in this course you're not going to get punished for writing things out more verbosely because, um, you know, especially at the start when you're trying to get your head around it. So that pretty much covers question three, which is Node.js. Now pretty much everything here really is normal JavaScript except for these two first lines because importing a library with require is very much a um, uh, Node.js thing, and um, reading from a file system is definitely a Node.js thing. You know, that's just like a feature of Node.js. So, let's look at the web browser example. And, and actually, I can show you this as an example, right? If I actually go to, um, this works with data1 and data2. You can try it out if you want. Like, we could just change the, change the number here from data1 to data2, and then that works, and then data two to data three, and then that works. But let's actually try and run this in the browser. So the first thing you'll notice is that if I go down to question four, there's a file here called me.html, which is an empty HTML page. Well, nearly empty. Just before we get into the code that's here, I'm just gonna leave this Node.js code here and try and load this up in the browser, right? So I'm going to load this up, and I'm gonna look at the console, I'm gonna press F12, expand this out, have a look at the console and you can see uncaught reference require is not defined. So again immediately the um, the browser implementation of JavaScript here is not familiar with that kind of syntax. If I get rid of that line we're gonna get a file systems not defined problem which is because you know we can't import it but if I was to just replace data here with just a list of numbers of strings you'll see what happens um, it says data.split is not a function. Okay, so now we're having issues with like being able to actually split strings here. Um, oh, sorry, my bad. Like this, let's do that. That's a raw string. So you can see this actually worked because everything else here besides those first two lines is just more like common core JavaScript. But let's get to the actual question here. So the question is, we've created a basic web page, me.html. Um, it's an empty page where some JavaScript runs. So JavaScript runs and it prints, it console logs its output, um, which is how we can see it in the console. Using basic JavaScript knowledge, implement this page to console log. My name is X and my age is Y when the page is loaded with the following added to the URL. So right now when we load this page, um, we don't actually like see anything because, um, uh, you know, we, we haven't added that to the end of the URL. So you can see what they want here is to add this extra part to the end of the URL. So if I add this here, not much really changes initially, um, like on the page because we're not actually doing anything on the page, right? Like if I added high here, then we'd get high, but we're not adding to the page. We're just doing console logs. So the way this works is that, again, there are aspects of JavaScript in the browser that don't really exist in Node.js. 
And one of them, for instance, is the window property. It's a giant property. Like if all I was to do was console log window um, and print this page, you'll see that inside of that, there's like, um, you know, capture events and blur and all this other stuff. And they're not even like, some of them are actions, some of them are properties, some of them are functions. Um, shows you where the screen left is, the screen top, the screen X, the screen Y, like there's tons of stuff here. And one of the properties is location. So if I go up to location, which would be uh, L location, you can see inside here I have um, the URL, like the full URL, including all that stuff after the, the file name. I have the path name, which doesn't include the extra stuff. This is what we call the query string, by the way. So in a URL, once you've actually got the resource path, you have a question mark and then everything after that is called the query string. We have the origin, which is basically the domain, um, the port, which there is no port because I'm running this from the file system. But if I was running this through a website, it would say port 80 or something similar. And then you can see the search part here. Um, and that's actually really useful because, um, you know, if that's what we're interested in finding, then, um, you know, we can uh, we can effectively use that, right? So if I want to get URL search here and I console log URL, um, then let's see what we get. I'll comment out these first. Okay, we get this, great. Now, if we want to extract those variables, what do we do? Now, in other languages or using certain libraries, there would be ways to actually do this in an automated way. Um, but in this case, um, we we kind of have to do it manually. So the way we're going to do that is just with some string, simple string manipulation. Um, I'm going to console log. I'm going to split this URL. Um, well, let's first thing. Let's try and remove this question mark here. OK, how do we do that? Um, JavaScript, remove first character from string, right? So don't be above Googling stuff. You're going to get a whole bunch of articles for really simple commands like this. And you can see that on strings in JavaScript, there's a substring method. Now, substring methods are pretty simple usually. Usually what they do is they take two arguments, which is where to start. Like you want to get a, a string within a string. The first argument is where do you start to get that new string and how long is that new string? If you don't specify the second argument, you'll tend to get from the start till the end. So in this case, I say I want to go from the first character because you've got the zeroth character, which is the question mark, and then I want to go to the end. Okay. So after I get that, I want to split it. I want to split it based on the ampersand to split those two properties up. And now you can see that I've turned it from a string into an array of two items, right? Which is name equals Francis and age equals 72. And for each of those, I then want to split it up again. So how might I do this? Well, I can say... Uh, const components equals the two, the array of two items, right? And then I might say that um, uh, const name equals components dot components zero dot yeah components zero. Let's start with this. Um, and age is this. Now, um, what I'm doing here is just printing the two parts, which is basically the same thing. So I've got my first part and my second part. Now, if I want to get the actual name out of my first part, I will split that again off the equals. And I'll split this one too off the equals, and this will turn my these little piece string here into um, two more arrays. Right? First array is name and Francis, second array is age and 72. And um, I'm only interested in the second element of that. So I could say I only want the, the number, the one index there. And now I get Francis and 72. So the original question which says my name is x and my age is y, well, I can do that now. I can just console log, console log, uh, you know, my name is x and my age is y, um, and I can replace x with uh, name, and I can replace y with age, like that. Done, right? We're finished. My name is Francis and my age is, 90, is 72. Okay, that sounds good. Um, and we printed that out. Now, I did this just kind of off the top of my head. Um, you can see that the solution that we have down here, a couple things about it, um, very similar things with 
it's all string manipulation. Um, one thing that was done differently here was that rather than use a substring to get rid of the question mark, it actually split the URL on the question mark and just ignored everything left of the question mark, which was nothing. Um, they split on the ampersand as well, which is good. And then the next part here was that they actually did some more funky, I mean, they, I, I wrote this, but <laughs> like, they did some more funky stuff where, um, this is a more general answer, where what they've done is written it in a way that if there was like five query string parameters, it would actually go and convert all five of them. Because obviously the way we've written it here means that we have to have a line of code for each parameter. And obviously there, there's going to be some repetition too, which isn't good. But yeah, it's all kind of on the same on the same path here. You can go and have a play around with that too if you'd like, which should be quite interesting to some people. Um, and then this is another answer which is trying to actually show the year that they were born in. So if I want to say, you know, my name is something and my age is something, um, console log, I was born in X. How do you determine what X is? Well, if you have an age, you can figure out how old someone is because you can just find today's date and take that many years off it. Now, how do you get today's date in JavaScript? Well, the most basic way is to use JavaScript's built-in date. Um, function class object, which is, uh, and you can get one by saying new date. So whenever you say new date in JavaScript like this, you're creating a new object um, of the date class, which has a lot of properties in, uh, built into it. So you can see here that when I just try and print that object, I get today's, I get today's date and time right now as like a um, string. You can see as I refresh that page, that updates too. <coughs> so then the next question is, how do I get the year out of that date? Right, there's clearly a year here, 2021. So maybe I'll Google that. New date, get year, JavaScript. JavaScript. Okay, I click on the first link. It says if I create a new date and then I call get full year on it, I'll get the year. Okay, let's try that. Let's see if this works. Don't get full year. 2021. Perfect. All right, well, now what we need to do is actually subtract the age off it. So minus age and that'll give us 1949 great so I might make this a variable called date of birth um, yep and then here when it says I was born in X I'm gonna replace X with date of birth I was born in 1949 perfect um, that works fine easy again the thing to notice here is that um, the JavaScript we wrote for Node.js and the browser is nearly all the same fundamental knowledge, right? What differs in this example is just this window location href line, which is where we get information from the URL, which obviously doesn't exist on the command line. And in the uh, question three, we imported a library and we read from the file system, which doesn't exist in the web browser, right? Because your web browser doesn't have some file system you can access like a command line. So they're the main differences there. Um, we'll have a little look at question one, um, which there's a web page, a very old web page, which we're going to just kind of review and poke holes in. Um, so this is, this is uh, a very old page that Richard made last modified 2005 um, which is not quite I'm sure there's some people doing this course that might have been born in 2002 I think but um, let's have a look here well firstly you can tell it's made in 2005 it looks like it largely predates CSS um, but it doesn't Let's try and rip it apart. So we're mainly going to look at the source code. We're not really interested in the UI or anything like that. Let's just look at the source code. So there are some things here that are non-standard HTML, and there are some things here that are um, uh, just not common practice. So first thing is you'll notice a severe lack of indenting, right? HTML, head, link, they're all at the same line even though as you move in through these elements they should be indented in some way um, you notice the inconsistent use of uppercase and lowercase tag names um, which isn't really great 
Uh, here you can see that the body is attempting to have its color assigned via an HTML property, which is very retro. Um, and you can see here, like, that is that is actually how it's set. If I, if I was to change this property here and get rid of it, um, the page... Oh, okay, I guess it's not using that anymore. Um, and maybe it's using some CSS. Where's it getting that from? The body tag. Where's the CSS on this page? I'm sure it's here somewhere. CSS. Ah, uh, there it is. Okay. I don't actually know where that's imported though. That's super interesting. That like, somehow we've managed to import a HTML page of CSS, that's a big no-no. You'd probably normally just actually import a CSS file directly, not another HTML page. Um, but you can see there is actually some CSS set here. So this is probably redundant. This is probably um, probably not even supported by browsers anymore. Um, void tags like BR and image, I believe in this code, don't have um, uh, like the trailing slash, which is pretty common these days. So if you have like a tag that doesn't have a closed tag, you use br space and then a, a slash. Um, you can see that HTML properties, right? Like TD is a tag, width is an attribute, and then 80 is that the value of that attribute. Normally the values are in double quotes, even if they're numbers. That's kind of pretty standard as well. Um, here we're styling code with HTML tags, right? We're using the italics tag and the strike through tag and the block quote tag. Um, nowadays, you'd be more using more general tags like p for paragraph, div, and span, and you'd be styling those with CSS. The use of h4 and stuff, like using these header tags, is a good thing. Um, the table here, and you might be thinking, oh, why are we using a table instead of like a CSS grid or something? Um, I think what's really good is, I think the best thing I ever read about tables is when should you use an HTML table as opposed to something like Flex or something like Grids? And the answer is whenever you're using, creating something that's tabular, right? As in like, it's a table. Is what you're trying to make a table? If it's a table, then use a table. Um, this is a table. So don't be afraid of tables. The point is you shouldn't use tables to solve non-tabular problems. This is a tabular problem. You're like, okay, it's two columns, got a title, it's got stuff in them, done. Um, so you know, I, I think that's I think that's fine. Yeah, the source code is not very well maintained, of course. Um, same thing, we're using caption tags here, which should probably be more general tags and CSS to style them. Um, the font tag, I think this one might even be deprecated, but again, usually there was a font tag where you could specify font properties, whereas now you would specify it with CSS. Okay. And um, last thing to go through in the shoot is um, airbnb.png is a contact us page taken from the Airbnb website. So let's have a look at that page. Okay. Um, lots of stuff there. Cool. That makes sense. Uh, so what we're going to do is the question asks us to create a page airbnb.html to make it look as close as possible. Now, y the solutions are going to be released on Friday, so I'm not going to make you sit here and you know go through 20 minutes of me being like, oh, okay, well, we first do this and then we do that. Um, though I will just get the key points across to you. Um, and let's have a look at the page. So... We got, what is it, airbnb.html? Should be blank, right? Okay, so it's a blank page to start, and we want it to look like this. So how would you go about building a page? Well, usually, if you're trying to build a page, one of the best approaches is just to try and do it. Um, oh, why isn't this working? Jesus. Yeah. Um, it's just to kind of try and do it pretty fast and loose, right? So if I was making this page, the first thing I'm going to do is trying to get the content down in major elements. So if I just have my standard HTML body, close body, um, close HTML, right? Um, 
I will try and put the elements in. Sometimes it's a good idea to start putting the HTML elements in before you actually put the um, the styles on them, generally. So, like what I'll do here, for instance, is I'll say, well, okay, this 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 text at the top looks pretty big, so I'll say that's a big text. Log in to contact us. Then after that, it's kind of like a paragraph, so this will help us quickly identify you and get you the right kind of help. Close paragraph, and then we have two buttons. So the first button says log in. The second button says sign up. Um, we seem to have a line underneath that. HR is a horizontal rule, like a, like a line. Um, we have some more titles which do seem a little bit smaller. So I'll say these articles might help. Um, and then we kind of have two columns. Now this is not what I would call tabular, right? Just because it can't, like this is the whole thing about tables again. Just because you could display it with the table, if you showed this to someone, they wouldn't be like, oh, it's a table of information. They'd be like, it's just two columns, right? There's something being two columns is not enough for me to call it tabular. So then we're actually gonna have to, you know, make these two columns. So um, let's just assume for now that they're both in divs and in each one there's like, an h3 and then maybe we'll just start off with some paragraphs. Now I'm just going to stub these. So we got like a, b, c, d. And another one here, um, which would be like, a, oops, e, f, g, h. We can copy that text in later. Um, so that's the starting point. Let's look at the page. All right, looks ugly as hell, doesn't it? So first thing is from the question, it says that we can use the font family circular. Okay, well, let's try and do that first. Now, I'm going to create a style sheet inside the head, like this, um, and style types text CSS, and I'll give the body some font family. All right, let's see how this looks. Oh no, why don't we have that? That's not good. And the reason for this is because some fonts are not actually. Um, uh, built into browsers, right? Or like, I should say more specifically, they're not stored on your operating systems. So to get those fonts, we can actually um, can actually download one. So if I just Google circular font, there's actually a lot of fonts that are available on, um, I don't know, maybe we can get it on Google fonts. Maybe not that one. We'll save that one for another shoot, but um, let's just stick with something simple now, like, I don't know, Arial. Okay, that's kind of close enough. Now, some other things you might notice. Look how much darker um, the text is up here. So, nowadays, it's actually very uncommon to have fully black text. It's just very harsh in the eyes. So, they might actually have something like, you know, like a very, very dark gray. Um, or even, you know, something like a little bit lighter than that. Um, you know, and this actually does take a little bit of the edge off looking at it. So, that's a good start. Then we might think, okay, well... You know, is this text big enough? This is looking roughly okay. Let's kind of leave that for now. Um, but then the hard one is the buttons. So we've got these two buttons here. Now I'm going to give both of these buttons a class type of um, like login buttons. And I'll give that both to them here. So login, like button class equals login buttons. Uh, button class equals login buttons. And then we'll see how that works. Let's give it just some rough properties. Um, they obviously have a border radius, as you can see, um, ours have a little bit of a border radius here, but not quite as big as that, so, um, oh, it's looking really dark now. Okay, that's looking a little bit closer to it, right? Something like that. It's obviously too small at the moment, which is part of the problem. Um, generally, if there's a lot of space between the button text and the outside of the button, right, that's the padding. So we're going to have to add more padding to it. Let's just start with 20 pixels in every direction. Okay, clearly that's too much on the tops and bottoms. So let's give more or less on the tops and bottoms. Okay, that's starting to look there. The font's a little bit small though, right? See how the font here is kind of large with respect to the page? So I'm actually gonna have to increase the font size. I'll just start with 12 PT. Okay, that got a little bit bigger. Maybe it needs to be a little bit bigger. Yeah, maybe I'll just go a touch bigger. Okay, that's kind of looking there. Maybe 14, 16 is fine. Um, this is mostly looking at, if you look at these buttons, they actually look a little bit 
tall and a little like not so wide so I might actually reduce this even more make this like 12 and 22 or something and yeah it's starting to look starting to look okay now um, I will also give it some space on the right hand side and the bottom side because you see how they're quite bunched up at the moment I might just start with the right hand side so I'll give it like five pixels on the right yeah that seems about okay and then when it comes to color normally you use a tool like um, uh, whatever it's called Photopea um, to figure out what colors you want um, but in this case we would actually try and um, just trying to see if I have the color here what do I have on my system um, let's try this background color see what it is background can be that okay yep that's the color um, now this is where things get interesting because you don't want both buttons to be this like aqua color right you only want one of them to be so what you might do here for instance you might say that your standard button is like this with a border color of that and a uh, font color of that this kind of aqua color okay you see the fonts also a little bit thin we might make it bold as well great um, so the sign ups looking pretty good the login's not looking great though so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to create another class called um, uh, like login button filled and what this one's going to do is this one is going to set the color to be white and it's going to set the background to be the same color as the border and text of the default button and then I'm going to add this as a second class to login here so that the first login properties are applied and then the second ones are applied after that and that's how we get a button like this um, now when it comes to these containers down the bottom here um, you could sorry um, you could do these a couple of ways you could use a table if you wanted to but generally one of the easiest ways here is going to be to use a flexbox so if I want to I might wrap this all in a container I'll call this some um, help articles for instance like this and then um, I will say that the help articles div is uh, display flex, right? So the flex container needs to have that property. When I refresh the page, you'll notice that um, it's, it's already kind of done this for me here. If I inspect this element, um, you can see that the, uh, yeah, you can see how these are structured. Um, they're not really filling the space. So this is where you might um, then actually give each of these properties and say like, help column so I'm gonna give both of my columns a class name and then that class name I'm gonna give it a property of flex one right because by giving it a property of flex one I'm now telling it don't just fill the minimum space you need but actually fill as much space as you can in this ratio it's a little bit like um like with the CSS grids lecture like the fraction stuff so now it's saying that both of these are going to hold one unit of space proportionally and because one is the same for both we have this effect here and then you could start going ahead and styling the h3s you know if I wanted to I could say that all h3s have a um, font size of 13 pt or something that seems small you know, like 15 pt um, might change the text to like getting started you know it's okay you just kinda gotta work through it it takes time um, but you know, with a little bit of effort, we haven't. We've gotten pretty close. The fonts obviously make things look a little bit weird in this case. Um, but you know, you, you could add more spacing. I guess maybe that's the last thing we'll do. Is how do you add more spacing to the login and sign up? Well, there's a couple of ways you could do this. One is you could wrap it all in a div um, called button area. This is probably the best way to do it actually. Um, and then you'll give that a margin top of like. 30 pixels and a margin bottom of like 50 pixels or something you know and you just play around with those numbers till it's kind of what you want 
<coughs> yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, I'm not going to take this to the nth degree, but you can have a look at the solutions on Friday. Um, or if you have any other questions, just post in the forum.